So a very warm welcome to um, our first, our first reach, all, reach Out Reach All webinar of the year, I think, um, certainly of this season, and it's your questions answered sleep in Estonia. We are delighted to be joined by two fantastic speakers, um, both with a strong interest in sleep. So there is Dr. Catherine Pill, uh, MRC clinician scientist, fellow and honorary consultant neurologist at Cardiff University. Hello, Catherine. Uh, and Vicky Beavers, who is the founder and the CEO of the Sleep Charity. Um, thank you both so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you giving your expertise and your time to be here. And we've got lots of people signed on, so this is a really, really popular webinar. Uh, so today, Vicky will um, be starting by presenting some general knowledge tips um, and uh, tips and tricks and best practice. We'll then have a short comfort break um giving you the chance after that to have your questions answered by both Vicky and Catherine um, about the best way to get a better night's sleep. Vicky, I'm gonna pass over to you for your presentation. Thank you, thanks. I think um, Victoria's going to share the presentation on the screen for me, thank you. And I could talk about sleep all day but I've just got 20 minutes and there's so much to get through so um, it's going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour of sleep um, but hopefully you will get enough to be able to make some improvements to your sleep. So can I have the next slide please? So what we're going to do is uh, try to think about your own sleep as I'm speaking and I'll be talking about the challenges that there are when you try to improve sleep because it is really tricky to improve your own sleep there's no doubt about it one of the key things is working out why you may have sleep issues and we'll explore lots around that and also we'll talk about some practical strategies for you to try right So just a little bit about the sleep charity then. So I set the charity up 10 years ago and we provide evidence-based sleep information. We're involved in lots of research projects. There's so much to learn about sleep. And we also campaign to increase awareness about the need for sleep support because I'm sure that you've come across this, that actually when your sleep's not great, there's not a great deal of help out there for you and that needs to change. So we do have a national sleep helpline that's open every Sunday to Thursday and there's the telephone number. So if you do find that you want to talk to somebody about your sleep, you'll be able to give them a call. So in terms of how common are sleep issues? Well, they're incredibly common. So if you are struggling with your sleep, you are not alone. Although quite often at night time, it feels like you are very alone. You're the only person that's awake. But 50% of children will have a sleep issue at some point. And the stats around about 40% of the adult population are affected by sleep issues. Um, and we know with dystonia as well, there's high rates of fatigue and sleep disturbance. And the other thing that we know is that research shows that if we're getting poor quality sleep or fragmented sleep, that often affects as well our sensitivity to pain. So the big message is you're not on your own. And sometimes just knowing that you're not on your own is helpful, but there's more helpful tips coming along as well. So um, in terms of dystonia then, disturbance to sleep has been reported to be around 40 to 70 percent um, uh, in terms of insomnia and also abnormal movements that may occur during sleep. So things like restless leg syndrome um, are one of the things that, that are more frequently reported as well. So if you're thinking, what is that? Um, it's that urge that you may sense to move your legs when you become tired and then it can actually disrupt your ability to be able to fall asleep as well, which is incredibly frustrating. So how does sleep deprivation actually impact? Well, I think sometimes we don't realise how enormous the impact of sleep deprivation is. It affects sort of every area of our lives. It affects our ability to concentrate, 
even to learn. So when we're asleep, we consolidate our learning. So our brains are still busy, even when we're snoozing. Um, it can affect daytime behavior. So sometimes you can feel more hyperactive or hypervigilant because you're sleep deprived. Uh, we particularly see this in children. You know, often parents will say, oh, they don't need much sleep. Look at them. Actually, it's a symptom of sleep deprivation. It can affect our mood. We can be more irritable. We can even be more sleepy during the daytime. We can be challenging. We can be not the best versions of ourselves. And most certainly our cognitive functioning is affected. Our immune system's lower. So we find that we start to pick up, um, you know, bugs, colds, that kind of thing. And it can even impact on weight. So when we are asleep, there are hormones being released and one of those um, affects appetite. So we may eat more because we're sleep deprived. And there's a huge impact on mental health. So there's big links between things like raised anxiety levels, and depression and sleep deprivation. And what we know is that you cannot meet your full potential if you are sleep deprived. So lots of huge impacts that aren't taken seriously. Uh, the positive about all this is that we do know that cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia um, can be helpful, um, particularly in treating um, patients who've got chronic pain as well. And what this means is it looks at identifying thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that are contributing to sleep issues. So this is the approach that we largely take at the sleep charity. We do also look at signposting people on appropriately. If there are medical issues that are impacting and pain and psychological issues, but the heart of what we do is really around CBTI. And a real important message here is you cannot control sleep. So people will talk about, I'm trying to get to sleep, but actually you can't control sleep. And we need to stop trying to, because the more we try to control sleep, the more we think I must get to sleep, the harder that becomes. So it's part of having that acceptance. You cannot control sleep. So if I offered you a million pounds, if you were asleep by 10 p.m. tonight, you can't control that you will be. Okay. So what we look at is actually doing some self-assessment and um, people talk a lot about routine and I will actually say sometimes it's got nothing to do with routine. It might not be about that you've got a, a poor routine or you need to improve your routine. It could be that you've got something like a delayed sleep phase where your body clock's programmed to fall asleep later and then wake up later. Or it could be pain that's stopping you. Or it might be that you're having a daytime nap and then you're not as tired when bedtime arrives. You may simply not be tired. You may not need as much sleep as other people. It could be around your temperature regulation. You may be too hot or you may be getting too cold during the night. Hormones can play uh, an enormous um, role as well. So certain times of the month for ladies, menopause, those can all have an impact on your sleep. Things that you are eating. So, you know, hot chocolate and a biscuit sounds a great bedtime snack. It's actually full of sugar and caffeine. Not the best thing to be having. Sensory issues. Is it too light, too dark? And what's going on in that bedroom? Environmental um, issues sort of linked in there. And lots, lots, lots more reasons why your sleep could be affected. And sometimes, yeah, there can be more complex reasons. So it might be, as I mentioned, that we need a multidisciplinary approach. So we need to be thinking about things like sleep disorders. So you may have heard of obstructive sleep apnea. And when we work with individuals, we're listening out for these signs. So obstructive sleep apnea is sleep disordered breathing. And, you know, usually there's a chronic snoring there, but just because somebody snores doesn't necessarily mean that they've got obstructive sleep apnea. But what we are listening out for is these pauses in the breathing. So the snore and then the pause, and quite often they'll be the old and waking up. Now, it's important that we're aware of this. And if you're recognizing this in yourself or a bed partner, it's really important 
that you do get some medical assessment around this um, because you can put all the good sleep practice in the world but if there's obstructive sleep apnea going on you are going to have um, sleep that's interrupted not the best quality and it does need treating I talked about rest restless legs earlier as well and that can be quite tricky to treat um, sometimes it can be linked to iron deficiency so it's important to get that checked out um, sometimes it, it can be exasperated if you're just overly tired which again isn't helpful it may be that a warm bath massaging the legs can help um, but actually again it may be that you do need to get some medical advice and bruxism, that is teeth grinding. So some people do grind the teeth and that can interrupt their sleep. It can cause things like headaches, a lot of jaw pain. And if that's occurring, um, it's important that you do get seen. And it may be that the dentist is actually the best person. There's been some effective treatment with hypnotherapy and also with um, sort of mouth guards to help with teeth grinding. Rhythmic movement disorder is again a tricky one to treat and this is when people may rock themselves to sleep so they may go backwards and forwards or head bang to sleep and then they just go out cold asleep but when they start to come up through the sleep cycles which I'll talk a little bit about later they may need to do it again to self-soothe. Again a tricky one to treat and needs some medical intervention and assessment in order to establish if that's the cause. Um, nightmares are something that we all get at points and these are very different to night terrors. So night terrors um, tend to happen at the start of the night and actually look terrifying if you witness somebody having one. Um, generally children and they may look as if they're awake but actually they're asleep. Nightmares happen in the second part of the night and are scary dreams that we tend to remember. Um, medical issues, there's all sorts of medical things that can impact um, pain, uh, medication that's taken. It's important to check out with the healthcare provider if any of the medical issues that you have could be contributing and any of the medication as well. And again, anxiety, mental health issues. If you're anxious, it's going to be harder to fall asleep. Um, if you're not getting your sleep, it can raise your anxiety levels. So there's lots of sort of overlap around those two. So I'm just going to look at some of the physiology that goes on then when we're asleep, because if we can sort of empower people with sleep education, if you can understand about your sleep, then you can start to understand why you may be having some of the problems that you do have. So first of all, I just want to talk about circadian rhythm. So this is your natural body clock and it doesn't run precisely on a 24 hour cycle. So some of us tend to be um, sort of night owls, some of us tend to be lark. So some of you will want to stay up later at night, but then have a lie in. Others may want to go to bed earlier and be up early. And some of you will just be like me, exhausted pigeons who would just like to sleep whenever. What we also have going on is we have a sleep drive. So think about it as a battery. So when you wake up in the morning, if you've had a great night's sleep, your battery's full and as you start to go through the day your battery becomes depleted and by night time you want your sleep battery to be empty so that you get into bed and you're tired. Now it may be that you have a nap in the daytime and it recharges your battery and naps aren't a bad thing necessarily but if you recharge it too much and it gets to bedtime and you're not tired you'll not be able to go to sleep because you won't have built up that sleep drive. Okay, So it's important that we build up enough sleep drive to be tired when we go to bed because otherwise we end up in that scenario where we're laying in bed when we can't get to sleep and that anxiety levels, those anxiety levels rise. So I've talked about the night owl lark thing and what we need to keep our body clocks on track is routine. So this is why routine is so important. We need a set wake up time and a set bedtime because that stops our body clocks from drifting because as I said, they're not on a perfect 24 hour cycle. So there's been research where they've put people in caves with no light 
um, you know, just darkness, no clocks, and that circadian rhythm can shift if it's not kept on track by routine. What's also important is darkness. So our bodies release a hormone called melatonin, and this makes us feel sleepy. So we need darkness in order to feel sleepy. And we can also, if we struggle with waking up in the morning, particularly in winter time, we can use light to help with that because light helps us to suppress the melatonin to feel more awake. So you can purchase things called light boxes that um, sometimes people who've got seasonal effectiveness disorder find useful. And I use a light box every winter. I find it really helpful. So I talked about different stages of sleep and what you can see here is the different stages on what we call a hypnogram. So at the bottom, we've got somebody who's having eight hours of sleep and down the side, we've got the different stages. So you're either awake, you may be in REM sleep, which is the red sections at the top of the sort of chart. That's the dreamy sleep, that's the light sleep. And then we've got N1, N2, N3, that's non-REM sleep. So what you can see is that we have our deepest sleep at the start of the night. So stage three is the deepest sleep. That's the sort of sleep where if someone tries to wake you up, you feel really groggy. It takes a little while to come round. You're really fast asleep. What you can also see is we sort of dip in and out of these cycles. So you can see if you look across the awake line that this person has had quite a few wakenings. Now, they may not be aware of all these because we have what is called partial awakenings. So we come almost up to being awake. We may turn over, go back to sleep, not even remember that this has occurred. When we do remember, it's usually if things have happened like, oh, do I need to go to the toilet? Can I last till the morning? Or I'll just see what time it is. Oh, it's five o'clock. I've only got another hour. Or it may be that something's changed. So we need consistency all the way through the night to sleep well. So if we go to sleep with the TV on, someone switches it off, we come to a point of partial awakening, we're much more likely to wake up and go, who turned the TV off? Or if we fall asleep with a light on, for example, so we need that consistent approach. Let's have a look at these. So talk about it, talk about how you feel and try to work out what might be causing it. You are an individual and so are your sleep needs. So don't try and follow five top tips. They won't work. Think about unpicking your sleep issues. In terms of pain management, it may be that you need a medication review. It may be exploring different mattresses, um, different types of pillows that might help, warm baths, relaxation exercises. It may be that you find body positioners um, helpful to be able to get comfortable. You can't sleep well if you're not feeling comfortable. That's important to explore. We actually sleep better in cooler environments and the ideal is 16 to 18 degrees. Our body temperature also drops in the night. So if you're getting cold in the early hours, that could be sort of waking you up. Breathable bedding is a real thing and maybe something you explore as is nightwear. And if you have mattress protection, you may need to make sure it's breathable. You need to think about the mattress that you're on as well. So sometimes memory foam can make us overheat. So think about actually, is your, is your body temperature okay? Are you waking up because of something going on there? Keep to that regular sleep plan. So regular wake up time, seven days a week, that will help to build your sleep drive. It will help support your circadian rhythm and make sure you get natural daylight 30 minutes each morning. And you may need some strategies to try to get this on track. So you may need to experiment with what times are good for you, but you shouldn't be laying in bed for sort of more than 15 minutes before you're nodding off. Screens are highly stimulating, so try to avoid any screens an hour before bed. They do give out light, which can interfere with your melatonin production. So that includes like computers, phones, anything like that. In terms of food, are you hungry? If so, you'll find it harder to sleep. Don't have a huge meal though, because that, again, is difficult to sleep, but you may need to put a supper time into your routine. Avoid sugary snacks. 
And if you go onto our website, you can check out a list of sleepy foods. So things that might help you to sleep better at night time. As I've said, light plays an important part. We want to increase that melatonin as much as possible. So think about blackout blinds, curtains, whether doorways are letting any light in. And if you do have some light coming into your room, that's okay as long as it's consistent. Um, open those curtains when you wake up and let that natural daylight in to support your circadian rhythm. I think about your bedroom. So is it comfortable? Is it calming? Is it free of negative associations? Don't be lying in bed getting stressed because then you associate the bed with stress, get up. If there's noise that's disturbing you, you can get white noise machines to mask it out or earplugs and try to get some nice calming colours in there. You know, decoration can overstimulate. And consider whether the bed and the mattress are actually supporting you and whether they're comfortable too. Um, you can use something called ACT, which is like a form of mindfulness at bedtime. So you can play with the thoughts that come into your brain. So if it, it's telling you that you'll never get to sleep, you could call that like negative Nora, give them silly names. Or ask yourself, how true is that thought? When was the last time I never went to sleep? You can also think of thoughts like junk mail. So there's junk mail coming into our inboxes all the time. We know it's there. We don't have to do anything about it. We don't have to read it. And it's the same with the thought. Acknowledge it. But let it go. It's really important to tackle one thing at a time. So think about what is your sleep goal right now? And what's the one thing that you can try to move you a little further towards it? Otherwise, it can become completely overwhelming. So that was like, probably like four hours worth of sleep information in sort of 20 minutes so it was a real whistle stop tour but I hope that you found some information in there that's going to really help you thank you oh, Vicky thank you so so much I appreciate it. it was a fast tour we we have left time so that after the break everyone can ask questions of which I'm sure there will be many for both yourself and for Kath um so welcome back everybody um just to check if one of my tech team can give me a thumbs up if i can be heard just so as i know for sure perfect perfect um lovely we've got loads and loads of questions um so i'm just gonna i'm just gonna dive right into it because i think that's probably the best way so let's ask our first one uh right this is for Catherine. Um, a common question for people with neck dystonia or cervical dystonia is that when their heads hit the pillow, their neck muscles go into overdrive and pull the head from side to side. Do you have any recommendations for the best types of um, medications that could help with this? Some of the medications we know that have been mentioned are baclofen, gabapentin, diazepam. Um, and so what can you tell us about those or are there any others that are more commonly used? So I think, first of all, to take the first bit of the question is that um, in sleep studies of people, the few that have been done of people with dystonia, this um, muscle hyperactivity, so normally um, in sleep you see muscle relaxation, there is uh, evidence we see hyperactivity, um, particularly of the neck muscles, um, not only in the going off to sleep period, but during the sleep period, which is at odds in, um, for you know, um, with what we see with people without dystonia. So it's a it's a very real phenomenon. Um, in terms of treatment, I mean, I, I think you can take it, look at it from several angles. Um, I think from a clinical perspective, my first step would be to look at what the underlying treatment regime is. So if you've got someone who's having regular um, neurotoxin injections, so Botox injections, um, you would look at those and whether or not you needed to um, readdress which muscles are being injected. Were you um, getting the right dose to see if you could lead to some improvement there? Then I think if you're going to add in um, tablets, I think, first of all, uh, it's important to say that there's no evidence. We don't have any clinical trial evidence to say that one type of tablet is better than others, nor um, specifically for use in dystonia going off to sleep at night. So I think I think everything is caveated around that. What do we tend to use in clinic? Uh, we tend to use things like clonazepam rather than diazepam. Clonazepam has a, um, a, a smaller um, addictive um, 
uh, profile um, and therefore can be used for, for longer periods of time. Um, it depends as well um, around pain because obviously um, uh, a benzodiazepine so like clonazepam muscle relaxant might not necessarily address pain as well. So some people do um, use uh, neuropathic painkillers. So those are things like gabapentin and amitriptyline. The problem with all of these drugs is that um, they do have impact on your brain neurochemistry. And that again is also important for sleep. So, you know, you're talking about a trade-off from, from the very outset and um, that then is quite individual for the person. So what you can talk about generically might not necessarily be applicable on an individual level, but um, certainly worth um, discussing with your individual um, consultants. Um, but we would certainly look back at the neurotoxin treatment if that was going on as well as to whether we needed to readdress that. And are there any sort of recommendations other than, um, other than the medications? Is there something people can do to help themselves? Um, specifically for this muscle hyperactivity in, in cervical dystonia, I, I, um, I, there's, no, there's no specific guidance, you know, I mean, there's, there's no specific dystonia specific sleep guidance at all available. I think, um, you know, we've had a talk, uh, we've heard about all the sort of things that as an individual, you can help to try and place yourself in the best position for the, for the best sleep that you, you can have. Um, so those are never going to be counterproductive. So those are all worth um, investing time in and trying to get into um, a pattern or a routine. Um, I think underlying all this is we don't really understand why particularly there is this muscle hyperactivity in sleep um, in cervical dystonia and or um, why there may be underlying sleep disturbances in dystonia. Um, and obviously better understanding those can better target um, treatment, but that's, that's some distance off at the moment. So I think it's um, in terms of pragmatism, in terms of what we have available to us at the moment, there's a, there's a degree of um, yes, speaking with your doctor and ha having a look at therapeutics, but then also taking into account all the factors we've, that have been discussed already this evening. And maybe for, for both of you, um, what do we know about sleeping tablets and, and sleep? And would these be recommended? And we've been asked, can you use them over a long period of time? And, and the question is referring to years and not weeks. Um, do you want me to take <laughs> to take that? <laughs> um, yeah, go on. I, I mean, I think uh, obviously um, long term hypnotic and those. I mean, that's how the drugs are, are largely referred to. Um, is not is not generally recommended. You know, I, th I think uh, you know the, the prescriptions come from the general practitioners. Um, they're generally um, not happy to keep um, prescribing these ad nauseum or, you know, um, without any sort of definitive plan in place. Um, again, no specific evidence for any specific um, sedative then in, in dystonia. So things like zopiclone and, and drugs like that. Um, and the issue always is this balance of, of neurochemical balance as to what potential side effects that by employing those drugs you could, could have and the trade off with that. Uh, certainly from practice wise, we don't tend to use that in the service that that, that I run, um, mainly for that, that trade-off side effect profile. And, and we think that we can, we can manage using some of the other drugs that I've already mentioned. Um, but yeah, different people might do different things in, in different clinics. Okay. So our next question is, um, Vicky, if you could jump in on this one first. Could you give us some advice on how someone can get to sleep quicker rather than being just so exhausted that they eventually drop off and perhaps thinking about the presentation that you gave what of the advice you gave earlier would you pick out as being sort of the first priority for someone to fall asleep quickly and and just so you're aware it's this person has neck dystonia that's answer, asking mm. the question okay yeah right thanks that's a real tricky question <laughs> um so i would say that it is probably about looking for those windows of opportunity in terms of tiredness so if you think back to um the information i was giving about building up that sleep drive so you can't force sleep um i think that's a really important message um to sort of take away from this so you can't make yourself fall asleep quickly 
what you can do is you can look at your sleep patterns and you can try to work out actually I'm more tired at say half past 11 at night than I am at half past 10 therefore I may have a better chance of going to sleep if I stay up a little later tonight um maybe if I reduce my nap in the daytime or I knock it off completely so that actually when you get into bed you're actually tired um and then I think it's also really important to try to forget the time because if you focus on clock watching then you can get anxious and sort of think oh, I've not fallen asleep yet and then that anxiety makes you more awake so it's about having strategies as well when you are in bed in terms of sort of managing those thoughts and it might be that you use some like basic mindfulness techniques sort of listening out for five sounds you might hear feeling five sort of um you know feelings being aware of the bed the pillow those kinds of things to try try to distract your mind away from focusing on tiredness and that anxiety increasing okay Catherine is there anything you'd like to add to that no I think uh, <laughs> yes I, I, you're trying to um speed up that going to sleep process I think as Vicky said it, you know you you don't have voluntary control over that um you can put yourself in the best position for it but you can't can't exert control over it so um I think um uh, yeah all of the things Vicky's outlined and um I I think what's what's been quite interesting is that we've done a study recently um where we've asked people to fill in sleep diaries so when they think they've gone off to sleep when they think they've woken up and then to score their overall sleep quality out of 10 like did they have a good night's sleep and 10 would be good and one would be terrible and then alongside that we've asked them to wear um uh, essentially like a Fitbit type watch and um, the movements that you get through the watch we can use uh, various algorithms to try and work out various not only is the person asleep or awake but also various stages of sleep and actually the relationship between the uh, sleep diaries so what the patient what the person perceives and then the watch in terms of the accuracy are often very different um, mm. and um, so sometimes uh, that perception of, of have we gone to sleep quickly or, ha or has it taken a long time to go to sleep um, in the reality in terms of time doesn't always match up is that I why think... my watch lies to me sorry <laughs> didn't mean to jump in then but my watch tells me i've got lots more sleep than i think i've got of a morning so um some of some of it is that i think some of the um you know like the generic um like um phones i watches um they they don't say how they derive their algorithm so sometimes they're quite out so they'll tell you that you've had 12 hours sleep when you know mm. you haven't and you've only had seven so I think you have to um, take that a little bit with a pinch of salt but um, we were using we were using the raw data on um, okay. the different algorithms so you know you can never be 100% confident but we were more confident that the data that we were getting was was accurate for what was actually happening overnight. Fab, uh, Vicky sorry I interrupted you then as you went to jump in but I was amazed you're on mute. I was actually going to talk about watchers and how they can actually increase people's anxiety. So we okay. get people who will monitor their sleep and then contact us and say, oh, I only had three hours sleep. Oh, how do you know? Well, my watch told me. Well, actually, you know, they're not particularly accurate. Um, so if you are using things like that to monitor your sleep, just consider that you may not be getting the best readings and actually that could be fueling some of the anxiety that you're having anyway so you know the measurements that Catherine talks about are very different to the ones that we'll we will get if we put our watch on and go to sleep so ditch the watch at bedtime is yeah the I mean time. that's really important because we couldn't use a standard watch readout because it's not accurate so we I mean would have made our lives <laughs> immeasurably easier if we could have done um, and we looked at a number of different brands and they're just not accurate um, uh, at all really for, for the work that we were doing so that's why we had to sort of get the raw data from the background so um, yeah. Interesting okay so um, the the next question is Early morning waking, uh, waking, sorry, is often common with anxiety and depression. Might there be any connection between waking with the experience of muscle tension and the creation of a feedback loop leading to the experience of psychological anxiety, leading to difficulty in going back to sleep? 
Indeed, can the psychological experience of increased muscle tension or spasm during the normal waking hours contribute to, to feeling anxiety? Um, and, and Victoria would have put that in the chat for everybody listening so that um, everybody understands and can read that question because it was quite long. Catherine first, perhaps. Um, so, so, yeah, there are multiple bits to that question, I think. Oh. Um, I, I think certainly the current thinking in research is that dystonia is very much a network um, uh, based disorder. So um, it's driven by, you know, not a single brain region, but the communication between multiple brain regions, um, but by the nerves that, that link up those regions. The regions that, that we think are important are certainly regions um, that play a role in mood and in anxiety, um, but are also important in sleep. So there is certainly at least circumstantial evidence that you're looking at common mechanisms that could be driving um, each of those processes and therefore one could feed into the other and, and drive the other, as well as generally um, uh, if we become, uh, if we're more anxious or early morning wakening can also be seen with people with low mood, um, one can lead the other outside of dystonia. Um, I think from a dystonia perspective, we certainly need um, a lot more understanding and a lot more work. And um, one of the things that we were interested in when we were doing the recent sleep study, and we, we did two, we've done two recent sleep studies, one um, with individuals with dystonia participating directly in the study, and the other one um, involving the UK Biobank that some people may have heard of. So a huge, big study across the UK um, that closed about five years ago now, but there were people, individuals with dystonia um, in that cohort. And they also had these wrist devices and we did some sleep work there. And we were interested in to see whether there was any relationship between um, the sleep disturbance that we could um, measure on the watch and a Patient, people's reported mood symptoms, so their anxiety symptoms, their depression symptoms. Certainly our more recent study, the one where we recruited people, um, we could find no relationship between those two, um, that we didn't find that high levels of anxiety were linked with more sleep disturbance. But we were looking at the sort of the very sort of minutiae, the very detail of sleep disturbance, so that, that may have impacted that. Um, but I certainly can see a, a theoretical model whereby um, the two are highly linked um, and linked in with the movement symptoms of dystonia as well. But I think it's really important to point out that we're certainly finding from the research um, that just because we've got some common brain regions being involved, the symptoms that people experience can vary enormously between individual patients or individuals with dystonia um, and, you know, that's another area on a research side that, and, and a clinical side as well that we need to understand better. So ju you know, just because sleep disturbance can be present in dystonia, it doesn't mean that everybody's getting sleep disturbance or doesn't mean that everybody gets anxiety. Yeah. So. Individual. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Great question. Uh, lots of involved parts in that, but brilliant answer. Um, Vicky, given the understanding of the importance of routine as part of good sleep patterns, are there any additional suggestions about early morning waking and things that might be helpful in, in getting back to sleep? Yeah, so um, in terms of early morning waking, um, really around what might be causing the waking. So is it that the person's had enough sleep? So is it that actually they're going to bed too early and they need to adjust the bedtime so that the wake time becomes slightly later? Um, so that's one consideration. Um, it could be things like um, in the summertime, if there's light coming in. So I'm particularly light sensitive, for example. And as soon as it starts to get light in the summertime, if I'm not at home where I've got my blackout blinds, my blackout curtains, I find that I wake early um, by the slightest amount of light. So it's considering if there's anything in the environment that may be causing the wakings. It could be noise sensitivity and things like the heating clicking on or even a neighbour going to work at a certain time that's disturbing somebody as they're in the light of sleep. Um, so it's trying to work out what could be causing these early awakenings. And if you can find a reason for them, then addressing the reason. 
in terms of going back to sleep that can be tricky um and because you can start to have your mind worrying so again it might be about distracting your mind and some people find it useful to do techniques like minus seven from a hundred like distraction techniques with the brain so that they can sort of you know the minds the mind can wander and not focus on the immediate of trying to control that sleep again okay brilliant uh okay for Catherine, next question is for you. Um, are there any studies that show poor sleep leads to worsening dystonic symptoms? So, so this I can be a bit more definitive about. Um, so the sleep studies that have taken place in dystonia, um, A, there aren't that many, but those that have, have tended to this point uh, involve something called polysomnography. So polysomnography is like, is the sort of nirvana of sleep studies where um, people go into a sleep laboratory and you get wired up and your heart gets wired up, you have electrodes put all over your head, you have your blood oxygen levels measured. Um, and then somehow with all of this kit on, um, you're meant to go to sleep normally as you would do at home. Um, and then there's a video on you overnight as well. Um, and um, so all of these measurements are continued throughout the night uh, and the electrodes on the head particularly um, enable us to, um, that hypnogram that Vicky showed that enable us to give us the different sleep stages. So there have been several studies for, with people with dystonia um, undergoing that process, mainly cervical dystonia, um, and on the whole, smallish numbers in each group. So usually under 20, because it's quite an involved um, process and it's often quite difficult to convince people to come in um, for that process. But there, those have consistently shown really that there's no link between the degree of sleep disturbance and the severity um, of the movement of the dystonia, of the motor symptoms of the dystonia. And again, um, there hasn't been shown to be any link with pain severity. So obviously there's a lot of pain in cervical dystonia, but that hasn't been shown to be linked with the degree of sleep disturbance. So interesting. that all points or at least lends some uh, evidence that there might be an underlying sleep disturbance in dystonia that's separated, separate from all of those factors in some people with dystonia, not, not everybody. Okay, interesting. Uh, and thank you for whoever asked uh, all of the questions in actual fact, and, and please feel free to, to keep those questions coming. Um, at previous conferences, we have had a lot of chatter, more than I ever thought I'd be involved in, about pillows. Um, so I just wondered if I could ask you both, and, and perhaps starting with Vicky first, how important are pillows in our sleep patterns? Yep, they are incredibly important. And um, I don't think I recognised how important they were until I started to get into the world of sleep. I was just thought a pillow is a pillow, you know. Uh, but actually, you know, they're, they're incredibly important. Um, quite often we are using pillows that aren't supportive enough or are even broken. I didn't know that pillows get broken, but they do uh, when they get all sort of floppy if you lay them on, on your arm. So they've not got that support in place. Um, so it is really important that our necks are appropriately supported and um you know i'm no expert in posture so when we do our work around sort of pillows we get experts in to talk about postural alignment and um you know sort of the best products for individuals to to use and again it's an individual thing um that's what is so important about this because we've all got individual needs um around the right sort of support that we need to be able to get comfortable and to keep our bodies in a good position while we sleep but yeah most certainly incredibly important okay I and just um just to add to that I think uh, I yep. completely agree and and pillow is very important and and pillow position but um even purchasing my own pillow I went into a, um, a well-known high street department <laughs> store and um just to buy a pillow and, and the gentleman who was the head of that uh, section insisted that there was no way I could possibly purchase a pillow just by picking something off the shelf and insisted uh, he got about 10 or 15 pillows out and I had to lie down and test each of these pillows and he was not going to allow me to purchase one until you know he made sure that it was absolutely right for me um, but um, it has made a lot of difference so um, there's a lot to be said I mean and there's just such enormous variety in shape and padding and firmness and all mm. of those things so I think it is one of those things you do have to probably try to make sure um, 
it fits. You also have to think we've all got different length necks and and you know and, and different size heads um different shaped bodies and what fits for one person doesn't necessarily fit for another so um i think that's that time investment there as well worth it yeah my husband uses a a memory foam pillow and that really works for him and it absolutely doesn't work so well for me so i think it is it's very personal isn't it yeah definitely and i think sometimes the only way to do it is to go go somewhere and, and test everything that they've got and see what see what works for you Catherine, you, you were talking about sort of different length necks and, and support. Um, with pillows and specifically, uh, obviously thinking about the, the dystonia in that way, are there any commonalities, um, commonalities, sorry, particularly for people with cervical or generalized dystonia? For example, we've heard that pregnancy pillows can be useful for some people with dystonia. Is there anything that you can expand on with that? So I think in, in neurological terms, the most work that's been done on pillows has been done on um, people with um, head injuries and spinal injuries, so in neuro rehab units. Um, and they um, there is available a very complex system whereby um, you have multiple bed sheets, like your bottom bed sheet, and then you can have a Velcro system whereby pillows are arranged in a specific order with another bed sheet pulled over the top to get sort of that perfect position. Um, and a lot of time spent in rehab facilities is spent on getting that arrangement of pillows, that Velcro arrangement in the right position for that person, not only for comfort for sleep, but also to stop things like bed sores and, and that sort of thing in, in that setting. Um, I think um, cervical dystonia particularly, so generalized dystonia, there are some elements with neuro rehab that would follow the same pattern because you've got, you know, you're talking about the trunk and you're talking about the legs um, and getting those body parts in the right position for comfortable night's sleep without putting like too much strain on your lower back or having too much of an arch in the back or, or any of those things is important. Neck dystonia is, is, um, is trickier because really the only bit that you've got is the pillow and then you know the pregnancy v pillows and, and those sort of things some people use you've also got to think it's not only the shape of the pillow itself but also how much degree of elevation from the flat that you've got so some people um it's that you know they find more comfort in having two or three pillows with maybe a v pillow on top so they're, they're quite upright when they sleep um whereas other people do much better with a much flatter position and um, so again i think you know there's no scientific research done specifically on this but i think the key is is comfort and position comfort and being able to get that consistency so you, you want to be able to find that comfortable position relatively easily um on a on a night by night basis so and just before we move on, someone has just popped in the chat. Uh, this person has neck dystonia turning to the left and they said, is it okay to sleep without a pillow? Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, yeah, yeah. If that's what's most comfortable and that means people get to sleep, yeah, of course. Fab. Okay, let's let's move on to pillows. Hopefully that uh, from pillows, sorry, hopefully that's answered all the questions. Um for Catherine then. Are there any neurophysiological mechanisms associated with dystonia that may be associated with depression, anxiety, or mood changes, as can be the case in other neurological conditions? So um, there are theories around this. Is there categorical evidence to support it? Probably not um, wholeheartedly. I think the main theory around um, dystonia is this balance between excitation and inhibition particularly in the frontal cortex, so at the front and the prefrontal cortex, which is the sort of the bit that sits just behind there. Um, and some of that has come from human studies. So when um, we've had uh, studies with electrodes on the head, and then um, some people may have experienced this when they use an electrode to stimulate a muscle in the hand or the arm, and you can measure the, the uh, currents then moving between a limb and the brain um, and be able to infer quite a lot of information from that. Um, some of it has come from um, animal models as well. But the thought is that there's either an excess of excitatory or excitation in these nerves and or there's a reduction in inhibition. So we've basically got a hyper excitable and over excited um, network system and that that potentially provides a sort of common pathway for explaining 
uh, both the movement symptoms, because we're getting too much movement, uh, and the symptoms of anxiety um, and depression. That differs somewhat if you take it compared to um, a disorder, for example, like Parkinson's disease, where the underlying process is entirely different, and yet people with Parkinson's have high levels of depression. Um, so that underlying process is thought more to be due to degeneration and wearing down of nerves. Whereas if you take a condition like epilepsy, there are high, higher than um, population levels of depression and anxiety, comparable really to dystonia um, in epilepsy. And some of the mechanisms that are talked about there in epilepsy overlie or are very similar to those discussed in dystonia. Um, it's probably not exactly the same because obviously we're talking about two completely different disorders, um, but there is some commonality there. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, for, for both of you, uh, please feel free, either one of you, to jump in. Can one of you please tell us a little bit more about restless leg syndrome, um, what it can be connected to, and is there anything that someone can do to help with the sensitivity? Do you want to go, Vicky? Or... <laughs> yeah, I've probably said all that I um, have to say about it, really, but, um, you know, in our experience at the sleep charity, um, it can be exasperated by tiredness. Um, it can also be really irritating because the more tired you are, um, the more restless the legs can become and that can then impact on sleep. Um, there is some sort of evidence that it can be linked to iron deficiency as well, so it's well worth getting that checked out. Um, it can be tricky to treat. Um, warm baths, massage can help improving sleep generally, but that's obviously not easy, can also be helpful. Uh, what we would be doing if we were um, coming across somebody who was sort of describing restless leg syndrome to us is advising that they go on to see um, a healthcare professional because we don't have that background and it's really important that these things are, are checked out. Okay, Catherine. So I think um, restless leg syndrome uh, in the general population is quite common. Um, it, you know, it's not an uncommon diagnosis. Um, there's no evidence to suggest that its presence is a higher level in dystonia than you would see in the general population. I think in clinic, um, it is certainly one of the harder um it's a, it's a tricky diagnosis to make because you're reliant entirely on someone's story. There's nothing to see. You know, you can't show somebody restless legs in a, in a clinic setting. So you're reliant entirely on someone's story. And the examination is usually um, normal. You know, you normally don't pick anything up on the examination. But, um, it, you know, it tends to be towards the end of the day. It's, it's that sort of uncomfortable feeling, the constant need to move the, the limbs. And then for some people, then that carries on into when they get into bed and, and almost lying in bed, get, going off to sleep. It becomes worse because they're not thinking about anything else at that time and the, and the restlessness um, becomes worse. Um, before I get onto medication, I think some of the things, um, and we have some success with this in clinic, is um, caffeine or higher levels of caffeine intake can exacerbate restless legs. So if you can cut down caffeine, smoking is well recognized to exacerbate restless leg syndrome. Um, low iron levels. So if people have a background um, of, say, for a kidney disorder or something as well, um, iron levels tend to be a bit low. And there's good evidence if you supplement the iron levels um, that you can lead to have, have some improvement, at least in um, restless legs uh, symptoms. Um, so we always check iron levels. I think treatment, the main treatment are, um, in terms of tablets, are dopamine agonists. So these are drugs that are more commonly are used in the treatment of Parkinson's, but you use them at much lower quantities and they can be effective in, in restless legs um, syndrome. Uh, the difficulty again here is we think there's probably a link with dopamine in the brain as to that driving restless legs, but the evidence is not a hundred percent in that direction. And you also get this phenomenon called augmentation when people are taking drugs with restless legs. So um, it's a bit like um, analgesic headache. So it's people with um, who have chronic headache and migraine taking more painkillers in itself drives the headache and makes the headache worse, as well as introducing another type of headache. So we see something very similar with the dopamine agonists and restless legs, that if people have been on the drugs for a while and the dose starts going up, then that actually exacerbates the restless leg syndrome in itself. 
Um, and really the only thing in, in that setting is you have to have a drug holiday. So you have to take people off all of the drugs, give them a good washout period of, of uh, you know, up to six, to six months, you know, maybe sometimes longer, and then you can come back in at a lower, lower dose. However, that's easier said than done. Um, and, um, you know, uh, not everyone's that keen to do that. But you can't just keep escalating the doses of, of these drugs because it will just keep driving the symptoms. OK, thank you both very much. That's, um, that's a great answer. Uh, so it's a common complaint for people that their dystonic movements can prevent them from falling asleep once they wake up in the night. Are there any particular things that people can do if they wake up in the night? to help them fall asleep again and um Vicky if maybe you want to answer first sort of more generally and then Catherine perhaps more specifically about dystonia Vicky would it be would I be right in thinking that it's a similar type of thing to um the the question earlier where they asked if they wake up in the morning and they're not really quite ready to be there yeah it is and it also depends what time you wake up as well so you know it's much easier to get back to sleep at the start of the night than it is you know once you get in towards that wake up time too um but it is around all those strategies that we talked about earlier and i think there's also something about actually at points getting up so we lie in bed for a long time trying 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 to get to sleep and actually there is something about going this just isn't happening right now and having a, a space to take yourself to that is dimly lit, that is calming, um, and seeing it as a positive strategy to use rather than I'm just not getting to sleep and building that anxiety, and maybe doing something there like reading a book, doing um, like colouring, if you, you know, anything like that, anything um, that people find relaxing and that can just take the mind off, I need to get to sleep, and then actually going to bed again once they feel that sort of tiredness come in so that they're stopping trying to force the sleep all the time and taking the focus away from I must get to sleep. Brilliant and uh, Catherine anything sort of more specific about the dystonia? No I don't I don't think there's any anything sort of dystonia specific there I, I think if it's a you know um, a position thing and you know you um, Again, going back to the pillows, if, if, for instance, your pillow has moved and that's woken you up because your head's moved, uh, you're in a different position, obviously getting back into that position. But um, again, I, I would completely agree with Vicky. Lying there, trying to will yourself to sleep is, is, is not going to help. And actually um, getting up, go, yeah, going somewhere else, breaking that, that cycle almost. I think it's also important to, to notice um, in that hypnogram that Vicky showed where we go through the different sleep stages, so we go from light sleep into deep sleep and then come up to light sleep, um, over a course of a night most of us will have two of those complete cycles um, and it's that deep sleep that gives us the refreshing, you know, the feeling that we're refreshed, um, but we do come up into those light phases during, um, during the night and if you wake during that phase you've completed one cycle and before you go into the next cycle you know, your body doesn't mind that so much. So if you wake at that point and going off to read is, is not is not so terrible because if, if you fall asleep again, you'll probably just go through another, another cycle. What your body doesn't like is waking when you're in one of the deep phases and being pulled out. So that's the alarm going off at seven when in fact you're nicely midway through a cycle. That's why it hurts to get out of bed at that time, so. Ah, that's why I don't like my alarm in the morning. <laughs> Got it. Um, okay, brilliant. Thank you. Is there um, any guidance on neck injuries from dystonia in sleep? And this particular person has pulled a strained muscle for two months and is finding the longer it remains, the more it triggers their dystonia and poor sleep. Can physiotherapy perhaps help with Catherine? If I can throw that one to you, please. Yeah, I, th I think obviously it depends on the type of the underlying injury. So particularly necks, you know, um, safety around neck stability um, is obviously really important. So I think if from a clinical perspective, it's been cleared and um, there's no um, structural injury that you know, might um, uh, uh, potentially cause harm to, to spinal cord or spinal nerves, and it's thought to be more muscular, then um, it sounds as though it's the pain from that that's driving that can aggravate the dystonia, which we, you know, we can see we see across the board, um, and then that that then is contributing to poor sleep. Um, muscles 
uh, muscle injury takes a while to repair. So, you, you know, you're talking sort of uh, eight, 10, 12 weeks really for the muscle um, to uh, recover and start to regenerate to, to give you some, um, to take over the traction basically and to, and to get um, the pain relief. You can take painkillers. Um, so simple, simple analgesics so over the counter painkillers during that period. Some people find that effective. Um, uh, the other thing is, you know, trying to um, put sort of localized pressure on if there's a muscle tear. So um, it's different evidence for whether you use cold, so ice type therapy, or whether you go for warm, um, uh, sort of, you know, those heated wheat bags or whatever that you can put in the microwave and try and improve things that way. I think the reassuring thing is if it's muscular, it will recover. It will recover by itself. This will get better. Um, it's probably just likely to take a little bit of time. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Right, I will say we've got just over 10 minutes left. This has whizzed right by. Um, so we will we will keep going. Um, so for Vicky, let's ask you this one. Do you know, is it common for people to act out their dreams? Um, for example, sort of quite violently if they're having a dream and they're, they're moving around a lot while asleep still? Yeah, so I would say it's not common, but it's not unheard of. Um, and when we do get cases like this, we've been looking at sort of risk assessing it because, you know, there are there have been cases where there have been, um, you know, accidents where people have been sort of acting out the dreams. Um, there's been cases that have made the news where people have been sleepwalking, had terrible accidents. I remember one. Um, where a young lady was actually sleep driving so she was going to a place of work yeah while fast asleep um so obviously there's wow. a risk assessment uh there's a risk assessment factor around that um and also the impact that it may be having on the sleep on other members of the household to sleep so if this was something that was occurring frequently we would be looking at um, signposting on perhaps looking at um as Catherine said having like a full sleep study to see what's going on um sort of neurologically what's happening um for that person during the night so that it can be addressed okay brilliant thank you sleep driving you said didn't you I didn't mishear that yeah, I said sleep driving and uh, we've had cases of people sleep baking, you know, um, actually making things during the sleep, um, all sorts of unusual nighttime behaviours. Um, we had one person who used to bury the alarm clock in the garden, all sorts of really odd things. Um, and actually, uh, you know, you've got to consider the risk of like, you know, going outside at night time or locking doors, mm. um, not being aware of what you're doing. And, you know, it, it can be quite dangerous as well. For sure. I mean, I can understand burying an alarm clock. I'm curious if the cake came out well or not. Uh, <laughs> message me later because I'm, I'm dying to know. <laughs> um, I think um, from a clinical perspective, I think the safety around um, dream enactment is, is the main thing. That's what causes us a lot of concern. So um, someone who came in with that story would, would probably go towards a specialist sleep service, clinical service, um, and very likely would end up having a full sleep study um, because then you're getting into discussing like what phase of sleep is this disturbance happening so is it in the REM phase of sleep or is it in the non-REM phase of sleep and those have very different um, implications so um, sleep um, services are set up quite slightly differently in different um, regions so some in some places neurology take on the sleep in other areas you've got people that are dedicated sleep specialists so um, but yeah I think um, any uh, active enactment particularly if it involves people getting out of bed and, and acting out dreams um, in adult life in children it's very common so when people talk about night terrors and children crying and walking around that that's very common in childhood but in adults it's slightly different so um, yeah that would need specialist referral okay brilliant um Catherine can you tell us if there's any sleep research taking place at the moment and are there any opportunities if so for people to get involved um, so we have uh, just closed um, hours uh, and um, have just um, submitted it to a journal to, for publication or, you know, for, for it to undergo peer review. I think um, uh, I have also been asked with um, a team in Calgary that we're going to host a sort of a professionals uh, dystonia non-motor symptom workshop later um, this year. And one of those 
one of the objectives from that workshop is trying to set up big international um, clinical trials um, of um, looking at care pathways in dystonia and how we can provide a more comprehensive um, international standard for care pathways for, for people with dystonia and sleep is definitely going to be a component of that. I think the difficulty we have, and this is what some of our work was looking at, is you need to be able to objectively as in using measurements as well as subjectively so how the person perceives their sleep be able to do that at scale um, because I've said you know the studies to date have been relatively small and, and we need to expand that out to, to more people and more involvement that's why the wrist worn device is quite an attractive thing because you can you can get more people involved rather than expecting everybody to travel to your center to go go in a sleep lab the difficulty you ha we have is the type of wrist worn device and then the type of mathematical models that we use then to try and understand that data. So going back to the actual original question, there's nothing actively ongoing at the moment, but I hope um, that collectively as a sort of an international dystonia sort of research community that we are going to be able to get something off the ground. Um, and it's probably going to be looking at sleep in combination with mood symptoms um, and motor symptoms and um, to try and get a bigger picture of that. Brilliant, thank you. So watch this space essentially. Yeah. Um, Vicky, you mentioned uh, earlier that screens before bed are bad. Um, I have one that I sit very low that plays and I fall asleep just listening to something. But somebody asked, are blue screen filters useful for um, technology devices? Yeah, so the research out there is still a bit iffy around screens and sleep. So, you know, you can read some research that says it doesn't really have a great impact. Others says that, you know, it's not good around sleep. Um, I go based on sort of our experience with the research work we've done. So just to give you an outline, we did some research with youngsters who are on um, the autism spectrum and every single family that removed the screen and that was the only thing, um, saw an improvement in sleep patterns. So I personally believe that it's not just about the light. I also believe that it's about the stimulation of screen activities because, you know, it's really stimulating. Even if you think you're watching something on TV that's helping you to relax, there's lots of stimulation going on there. So I believe that it's really helpful not to have screens, although some people have developed sleep associations with screens, whether that's to be to listen to sound on there and would find it stressful to give that up. Mm. And that is not what we're suggesting. So if it becomes a stress and a barrier to sleep to get rid of that screen, then don't do it. But if actually you're using a screen, yeah, you could manage without it in the hour before bed. It's well worth trying it. And in terms of the filters, again, you know, various sort of things out there that suggest, yeah, it may be helpful. Yes, it may not. The best thing I would say is try it and see. But if you can ditch the screen, because it's not just about the light, it's about that mental stimulation. And there are better things to be doing in that hour before bed. Brilliant. Thank you. Great answer. Um, super quick. Uh, Catherine, there was a follow up about the international conference you mentioned. And, um, oh, she's gone, she's gone? No, she's not gone, she's still here, excellent. Uh, will they be looking at the Estonia Recovery Programme by Dr. Ferreras, I think I pronounced that correctly, in Toronto? Um, so, uh, in brief, the, the whole conference hasn't been sort of sorted out just yet. So I think, um, I think all options are gonna be brought to the table. Uh, and um, I know that there are several teams in Canada that have very clear views on, on what they would like to do. Um, we've uh, also in the UK have done some preliminary work looking at cognitive behavioral therapy for mood symptoms. And we believe at least on the back of that, that that represents a, a potential opportunity for effective treatment. And, and I guess going into Vicky's um, the, earlier on in the presentation about CBT relating to sleep as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of commonalities behind what a lot of us would like to do to get a more comprehensive dystonia care package. It's 
just that for any of our national governments to be able to implement that, we need strong clinical trial data. Um, you know, we need to have these registered as clinical trials. They need to be reported on um, and we need to be able to show difference um, in order to get the funding to be able to do that. Um, and realistically, we can only do that as a scale um, where you know, we all chip in and, and, and do that. So I suspect the Toronto method, as we refer to it, um, will probably be on the table. Whether or not that's finally what we go with, I, I don't know. Okay, brilliant. Right, I've got time, I think, for one more very, very quick uh, response from you guys. Uh, Catherine, if I can throw this to you, you've got about 30 seconds to respond, no pressure. Um, if someone has experienced pain attacks from their dystonia and painkillers are barely touching the pain or they're vomiting them up, what would you recommend to go to hospital for stronger pain relief? To go back to see their clinician, is there a recommendation you can give? Um, I would go back to their neurologist, the person who's looking after them from their dystonia. I think if they're not keeping any um, oral medical medication down I think a and &E are unlikely to give an injectable in in that setting so you know stronger tablet painkillers are not going to help if they're not staying in um, and um, going to a and &E and doing that is 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 just a short-term measure anyway you need to to start resolving it on a longer term basis and that's best done through the neurologist brilliant thank you Wow, I mean that hour absolutely sped by and it's clear from the presentations and the questions tonight that it's the, the subject of sleep is really important but getting a good night's sleep is a massive concern for people with dystonia. Um, so maybe uh, in a very quick, quick answer I can ask you both, um, are you optimistic for people with dystonia that sleep can get better? from my perspective yes I think it, I think we can certainly do better at managing it and I think a better management of it will lead to um, improved experience I think. Brilliant Vicky? Yes I believe strongly that empowering people with sleep education is so important and being able to understand sort of the reasons behind why you may not be able to to sleep and some of the basic sleep physiology is essential so that you've got ownership of it and hopefully people will be able to you know start to unpick it for themselves now as well a little bit further after this evening's presentation brilliant i mean a massive thank you to both of you uh, our speakers Catherine and vicky this has been a really helpful and informative um session and we've had some lovely feedback throughout uh, with people thanking both of you. So on behalf of our team and, and the wider community, thank you. Um, thank you to everybody that attended. I'd like to thank my team, uh, Bernie and Fran on tech and Victoria, who very kindly feeds me all of your questions for us to then put to our speakers. Thank you for attending. Um, we look forward to seeing you throughout Awareness Month. It is uh, Dystonia Awareness Month at our upcoming webinar at the end of the month, uh, which will be around uh, mental health and your questions answered. So once again, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you to my team and thank you for everyone to attending. Have a lovely evening and we'll see you soon.